and we're gonna move into the main session. So you probably have read a little bit about Morgan's background in the event page. I'm super excited about her sharing. So she's originally from Taiwan and in her session, she's going to tell you a little bit, a lot more about her journey and her experience. But essentially from Taiwan, she then, you know, like did her degree at MIT, especially in the AI machine learning space. And then in addition to her experience in labs and startups, she also started her own startup and with funding from some of the very prominent VCs in the Bay Area. And later on, she moved into the venture side and now she is the partner in the enterprise team at Foundation Capital. In case you don't know about Foundation Capital, it's a VC firm with three billion as an under management, um, mainly based out of Silicon Valley. They have over 200 portfolio companies. And then so I'm very excited to welcome Morgan. When I met her through actually one of our previous speakers, Tiffany, in San Francisco at my home, um, I guess, you know, we had this conversation about being in Taiwan and how do we basically kind of like get more involved with this ecosystem. So when I mentioned that, hey, you know, guess what? We have this Women in Venture um, Roundtable series. Maybe uh, you can share a little bit about your experience, what you are seeing over there. And she quickly just say, yeah, for sure, sign me up. So I am super thankful that she's here with us. I'm gonna pass it over to her and she will share about 15 to 20 minutes about her experience, her background, her investments. And then we're gonna move into kind of like a fire, fireside chat session. If you have any questions, obviously we have the Slido page before, but feel free to just basically post your questions in the chat. And later on, we're gonna basically open the floor for you to ask questions directly as well. So Morgan, take it over. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I, for the first part of my introduction, I think I, I will share it in English, but like in the Q&A session, we can talk in Chinese if that's much easier for everyone. Um, so I, I grew up in Taipei, Taiwan. I actually came to the States uh, when I was 14. So I went to high school in Phoenix and uh, always kind of knew that I would go to MIT to study physics or computer science and actually ended up there um, and uh, study major in electrical engineering, computer science. Um, didn't really think what I, the classes I had taken was enough. So stayed for another year uh, for my master specifically focusing on um, machine learning and AI. Uh, when I was at MIT, I was exposed to lots of different startup opportunities and activities and gotten to know a lot of like pretty amazing um, MIT alumni founders. So um, I became really interested in, um, you know, potentially going to Silicon Valley and then start my company one day. And so I came to Silicon Valley in 2014, I the first company, the first startup I joined was this company called Flux Factory. So Flux Factory used to be a project called G, uh, Project Genie within Google X. So what they were trying to do is they were applying machine learning in architecture construction process to kind of like optimize for for the process kind of like acceleration. And I was working there as a product manager. And a uh, full year or so, I realized that, hey, you know, if I do want to do my own startup one day, I wanted to had, uh, have a lot more hands-on like engineering experience myself. And so um, after that, I joined another also Series A early stage company called Loop AI Labs. So uh, what Loop is doing, um, you can kind of think of them as uh, building something very similar to IBM Watson, where we have a um, a enterprise grade um, deep learning system, um, but it is not a an application. Uh, it's not a an application product. So the way that uh, the business work is that we will uh, collaborate with various different sort of like business count like enterprise companies, and then we will scout out various different use cases, and then we will bring in core team technology to help them with uh, process like automation and. Um, for the engine that we built, it was a um, NLP focused um, deep learning engine. And then so I worked there as a machine learning engineer and I was involved with a lot of like pretty latest NLP research, um, engineering development, et cetera. And because of that job, I was exposed to lots of very interesting NLP use cases. And uh, I, um, I spent a lot of time like outside of my work, um, hanging out with 
uh, a lot more successful founders, friends of mine who have like companies that are already at growth stage and whatnot. And one of the interesting problems that we have seen was that um, a lot of those companies will actually like record their sales phone call and the sales manager will review the call and to kind of like provide the sales reps feedback. And I thought that that will be a very, very interesting kind of like problem to, to apply NLP on. And then so I kind of like work on the project while I was at that job. I built out the initial product and I found a few customers and I eventually quit my job, found a co-founder, raised a round of funding. And um, we, we basically built this enterprise B2B software that will basically be able to listen in, into um, your Zoom call or like any sort of sales phone call it will record, transcribe, and then uh, we have like this internal machine learning engine that will perform information synthesis to provide insights either to sales manager or to end users who really just want to digest. Um, and um, when I was working on that project, I got to know Foundation Capital, which is the current VC fund that I'm working for. And I think they just happened to really like me as a founder and also really like the problem space. So they brought me into the, the fund and then also kind of like incubated my, my, my company. And um, at, a, at a later part of, of my journey with our company, uh, we were uh, focusing specifically on um, aiming to provide the highest accuracy or precision, like meeting notes for our user. But one of the uh, bottom bottleneck that we, we encountered in the end was that we realized that the current state of the NLP technology, even, even right now, the accuracy that we would be able to get to just weren't really able to get us to hit part market fit. At the time, we actually still have quite a lot of funding and I was thinking about like whether there will be another idea that would be much more interested in pivoting to. And uh, I actually didn't find any, I didn't really want to build a company just for the sake of like building a company. And then so um, I think my, my journal partners and my partners kind of like realized that I wanted to, I was exploring other ideas. So they spent a few months kind of like convinced me to, to join the team and then pick to be him an investor. So I think my journey to, to coming into venture is actually extremely serendipitous. Um, and then so I joined foundation um, in, in early 2018, I have been with a fund for over two years now. Um, and uh, I am one of the partner on the enterprise B2B team. And so I'd love to kind of like give everyone a high level overview of the fund. So the fund has been around for 25 years um, and uh, it is actually one of the uh, earliest VC fund, one of the earliest only VC fund uh, that was founded by, by a female uh, co-founders. And then so, so we were very big in uh, supporting minority founders very early on in our fund's uh, history. Um, the fund has been around for 25 years. We're currently our fund night. We actually closed fund night earlier this year. It's a $350 million fund. Um, and on top of that, we have a $150 million leadership fund, specifically investing in any sort of like fund driver um, that has, you know, that has have early sign of success um, in, 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 the, in, the, in their journey. And um, we are a industry agnostic fund. So uh, the team is separated into the consumer team and enterprise team. On the consumer side, we are actually really famous for our enterprise practice. So we have um, a lot of different sort of lending and insurance companies like Lending Home, Lending Club, et cetera. And um, um, we also have a, uh, a frontier, tech of, uh, frontier tech investing practice where we have invested in um, 3D printing, satellite company, um, AI inference trips, etc. And then we also have a more traditional enterprise B2B uh, focus kind of like practice, which is the part that I'm responsible for. We have made 200 investments so far since the, uh, since the funded funding of the, of the fund. Uh, we have taken 26 companies to IPOs. Um, the more, more notable investments that we have done were um, Netflix, we invested in Netflix when they were less than 10 people. We invested in Czech, Sunrun, uh, Lending, Lending Club, uh, Tubi Mogul, Freewheel, etc. In addition to that, we have taken 68 uh, companies and um, helped them successfully exit it. 
and uh, we typically come in at Series A. So the average check size for Series A, I think right now with the current market, kind of like craziness, it will range everything from five to $15 million. But also because of how the market has shifted in the past few years, we also have tried to go a little bit early. So right now we are doing a lot more pre-A kind of deals for which that we're putting three to four million dollars or two to four million dollars into a pre-A company's own 15 to 20 percent ownership and help the company raise its next round of financing. Aside from seed and A, we'll do everything up to series C and we always lead around. Like we don't really follow, we just whatever check size we will lead. Um, and uh, I think one of the interesting things that we have been putting a lot of effort into, which is also a trend that I think will be interesting to share, is that I would say in the past two to three years, we have been putting a lot of like resources into building customer network for our um, enterprise portfolio companies. So we have specific customer network uh, for for our um, security companies where it just basically is a group of connections of all the CISOs of Fortune thousands companies and then we do that for security uh, HR um, and then I specifically help foundation build our customer network for um, the CTO um, kind of like CIO uh, VP of engineering space and the reason that uh, this has been such an important focus for our fund in the past uh, three years is because um, I think right now, um, I think the fundraising cycle has become like shorter and shorter. And then what we can really do as a VC to stay competitive when there's so much capital in the market is to, um, you know, kind of like provide kind of like sales accelerations to kind of like attract potential like companies that we want to invest in. And it has been proven extremely uh, effective, no matter is winning the deal or actually um, helping our company reach uh, the finish line. So I will give one example. We invested in this um, RPA company called Tonkian last year. So when we invested in a company, it was a C round. The, the, the CEO couldn't really, like he couldn't close his round and then we kind of like met a bet on him as a founder and then so investing in the company when they have like no customer we made 20 um, enterprise customer introduction their revenue grew from zero to four million dollars within a short eight months and then we helped them raise in series a and then the series a uh, process went extremely fast it got like five offers within two weeks and then the the a round was ended up leading by life speed and then so we kind of have already figured out our playbook and then we are going to like execute a lot more um that sort of like portfolio um support for for our companies i think the other thing interesting to note is that i think a lot of my peer firms let's say Redpoint, sequoias or like kleiner etc I, I think they are all uh, putting a lot of resources um, into um, hiring someone um, specifically just to do the BD work for portfolio support. So um, one of the content I know from Workbench based in, based in New York, um, Le Ping, he used to be a principal at Workbench, which is a pretty prominent uh, C firm in New York. And then he recently joined Sequoia, not as a venture capitalist, but as a BD person specifically help them build enterprise, their enterprise customer network practice. And I think the other very interesting trend that I also have seen is that like you will see all the, most of the, the sort of like, I would say industry agnostic fund to, to um, start to shift a lot of their focus into doing enterprise investing. Um, like a few of my friends at Sequoia who used to only uh, did consumer investing are all have all started to do enterprise investing starting this year so that is actually just an interesting trend to to kind of like note at least on the, on the states in the states personally at foundation um i think most of my investments has been um investing in business that has um has some sort of like ai enabled technology kind of like components inside i have invested in this company called soteris is a uh, ai in enabled insured tech company i'm investing in turing.com um, which is a ai enabled remote worker staffing agency uh, dover which is also another hiring platform um, and then i have worked on a lot a few other more 
um, infrastructure focused um, machine learning companies. Um, moving forward, the investment areas that I'm interested in is, I think the number one space, I think it's up and coming. I think only a few VCs have kind of like dabbled into the space is the whole uh, B2B financial uh, system automation or like infrastructure automation. So um, what I'm interested in are companies that are basically either building next generation of ERP systems. So ERP systems are um, resource management processes systems or companies that basically uh, try to capture a specific part of the what ERP system focusing on and then build a more use case specific kind of um, uh, companies, no matter is like bookkeeping or like um, account payable, um, kind of like settlements, etc. I think there's a lot of activities in that space and then it's actually definitely a space to be disrupted. Um, I think the market last year spent like $35 billion in the United States only in the ERP space. So it's a huge market for startups to capture. I'm also very, very interested in um, a lot of more infrastructure um, layer of the uh, B2B uh, fintech uh, system. I think one company that I have kind of like brought in into foundation is this company called Phoenix. So you can think of them as like Stripe, but, but it's a B2B focused kind of like Stripe kind of solution. So I think that part is very interesting. Um, I am also uh, very interested in the local local space. So we have made one investment, Tonkian, in that space. Um, I think in the past few years, we have seen tons of growth and tons of investment um, um, around like RPA companies, no matter it's UiPath or automation anywhere that actually bring in uh, their engine and then to help their enterprise customers kind of like place or like build a customer's kind of like automation system and then they will charge them based on um, the actual saving. Uh, but I think uh, what I have seen in this space is that I think there are more and more startups trying to build this sort of like UI path kind of like solution, but specifically for um, for for end like end users who uh, who just want to like do a self serve version of um, of a of a applications that maybe automate part of their sales processes with part of their HR processes. So that space is very interesting. Um, I think the other one that's very interesting to me is. Um, any software system that kind of like enable uh, remote working. Um, and then so I, because of my investment in Turing.com, I can I kind of have like dive into this space very deeply. And then so I don't really think I'm going to make more investments in hiring because I already invest in two companies there. But the type of companies I'm interested in are companies that are either um, creating uh, platforms that make um, international remote workers onboarding much easier or providing benefits for remote workers or uh, making payroll, international payroll system much easier for um, the sort of international remote workers. And then I think the last space, I think it's always there, but I think it was it will become more and more interesting. It's just the general DevOps space. Um, I think DevOps is definitely a non-trivial space to invest in because it just requires so much like technical backgrounds and then there is so much like nuances. But what we have seen in the space is that because of whole COVID situation, <clears throat> I think there's a um, there's a uh, accelerations of like companies that are trying to like move from like on prime to cloud. Um, much faster than than ever before, just because like, hey, if you don't move cl to cloud, right, your your workers just cannot work from home, and and I think for right now for any companies, we just cannot predict like when the next block swan even might happen, or maybe when the next wave of the pan pandemic might happen. So, for companies that have a lot of like technology resources, I think they're adopting this sort of like fundamental infrastructure companies much faster than ever, and I think on the more SMB side of companies for which that uh, they might not have that much uh, IT resources to deploy. Their focus is more around um, adopting softwares that uh, enable remote working much easier, no matter is like, you know, system privacy control, et cetera. So I think those four areas are top of my mind that um, I will venture further into in the, in the upcoming year. So I will end it here and then I will, I will pass this to Alyssa.
Thank you so much. Wow, that's like a lot of great information.